Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5 has been the uh, theme, and uh, Pastor uh, Mike had sent that information out. You know, you take that theme and you just begin to read it and the context of it, and you do all kinds of things with it, and you ask the Lord about it, and you meditate on it, and you chew on it, and you read it over and over and over again, and you're trying to pull out of it uh, what the Lord would have for us to hear. And um, this passage that he said in Ephesians chapter 5, oh, verse 13, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Christ will give you light. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 23, he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind is a spirit. It's not an organ. It's not like your brain. Your, you have, your mind is, is that uh, spiritual side that God created. And the spirit of your mind has to be renewed. He says that you put on the new man which was created according to God in the righteousness and holiness. Then he goes on down in chapter 5. He says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love. Walk in love. That is impossible for a man or woman to do without being created again. A person that just attempts to walk in love is not the kind of love that is talking about here because God is love. And so he says, walk in love, walk in God, walk as dear children, walk in love, how? As Christ, walk in love as Christ, also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Remember that. As you walk in God, you smell. Okay, now we're going to we're gonna get, I'm, I'm kind of just warming up to this because um, he says this in context when you read that. He says, walk in love is Christ, and as you're really doing it, it's going to begin to bring an odor and a smell to God. <laughs> then you skip down to verse 8. Uh, there's been a preacher, I believe it was Manny. He's really helped me uh, because he, he, the Holy Spirit is in control of this, folks. You have to understand that it's not just a man up here trying to do something or men getting a sermon together. The Holy Spirit is, is uh, woven through the whole thing. Uh, even uh, tonight in the dance, and then Gabriel getting up, and do, what, do you realize what he did to get us to forgive? He's getting offense out of the way. One thing that'll stop you from hearing God is offense. You can't hear God if you're mad. Um, I know that probably not many couples here ever fight in marriage, but if a husband gets offended at the wife or vice versa, she don't want to hear him. If, if she's mad at him and he's done something and he comes, he says, oh, honey, I love you. She says, yeah, I got a big deal. Because, because she's offended. That offense causes her to go deaf. Many times we can't hear the Spirit of God because we're offended. So what does God do? He says, okay, I got to do some business here real quick. And what he called us to do was to forgive, or if you have an offense, just lay it aside for a while, okay? Just do that for me. Just, um, if you're mad at somebody, or you're offended by something, you didn't, uh, you didn't, whatever happened in your life, and you're offended by it, take that offense and just lay it aside. 
Pick it back up after church. <laughs> because it's very critical for you to hear what the Spirit has to say. Because if you miss this, you're going to miss something very vital. You're, you're going to be out of step. You're not going to be in step with God. He says, walk as dear children. Walk. A child walks. He says, walk as children. Right? As you walk as children of God, following God. How, how in the world am I going to imitate God? How in the world am I? He commands me to do something in the human way? It's impossible. How can you do that? Well, you've been born again. You're a new creation. Man, he taught you've been born again. You, you don't have church membership. You didn't just sign up for something. Before. You've been born again. You're a brand new person. I love Ron Simpkins and I, we're buddies, he, man, and when we talk about stories of the past, that Joe Weidinger is dead. He, he not only dead, he's buried. Amen. And when we tell stories about it, it's just like going through some journal or some uh, photo album. We bring him, oh, here's Joe. Remember how he was? He was just a nut. He was just crazy and wrong, crazy, both drunks and all kinds of things. Isn't that nice? He said, yeah, yeah, he died a long time ago. You're dead. Well, how that? You died in Christ. Not only dead, he buried you. Amen. We, oh, God, I give you my life. I know my life is wonderful, and you, have, you can use my life. I got a lot to offer. And God takes that life. He says, man, praise the Lord God that gave me your life. He takes your life and kills it. <laughs> there was nothing in your life he could use. You were crucified. That's what Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. I have been crucified. I have been crucified. So the idea of looking at this and you're going to walk as Christ, be imitators of God, walk in love, you can't say, well, I just can't do that. Oh, yeah, you can. Sure you can. So he goes on in verse 8. He says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walk in love. Walk in light. Walk as children of light. He, the first thing he's telling us is there's a way to walk. And you have to walk in light. Walk in love. You know, walking, everybody here walks differently. I wish we could just have him, sorry, Mark, Mark, walk across here. He's going to walk, and then Danette's going to walk. Everybody has a different kind of walk, right? Yeah. And so he doesn't say walk, you know, like a pastor. How does a pastor walk? <laughs> you know, now sometimes convicts, you know how they walk. They walk and they kind of drag a foot. And they know, man, you look at the walk and you say, man, that guy's been in jail. <laughs> All right, how, how do you, people walk bad. I've, I've seen people, they strut. He doesn't say walk like a peacock. He doesn't say, you know, walk like a convict. He says walk in love and walk in light. Well, how, how does someone walk in the light? Well, you walk in love. Okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. See, you got born again, but just like a baby's born, it doesn't come out of the womb walking does it? Becky and I had six kids. I never had one kid up, but just born right out. I said, get up and walk. Go get your own sandwich. <laughs> you know, you know, they, they had to learn <laughs> to walk. Okay, Becky, Becky and I love to walk. We, well, Becky loves to walk. <laughs> I'll, I'll walk with her. You've been walking, you know, just walking. Then you come home and you sit down and you, and all of a sudden you you smell something. What is that smell? And you just the first thing you do, what do you do? You go on a walk and you come home and you sit down and you smell something. What's the first thing you do? Well, come on, just, to, just work with me, folks. You get this a hard crowd already, man. Yo, Manny, Manny, he smells under his arm. <laughs> no, you look at the bottom of your shoe. 
standing there next to somebody, his two buddies, and, man, where did you step in? I said, God, I don't know. Well, see, that's what this is all about. See, you're going to have to deal with sin differently. Because you've been born again. You're a child of God. So when you walk, you're going to step in stuff. And the stuff you step in stinks. And so when you're sitting there and been walking and the person next to you looks, yeah. He, doesn't, he may say, you stink. But it isn't. That's not his identity. That's just something he's got from walking. See, we, so when you step in something, what do you do? You see it? You go, Phew. then what do you do? Do you get some more of the stuff you stepped in, try to clean it off? You say, where did, where did that come from? I have no idea. Well, how did you get it on your foot? I have no idea. So we scrape it off and we study it? <laughs> yep, that came from a big dog. That's a German shepherd poop. You smell it, taste it. We're getting somewhere. Because what happens to us folks, we're not careful, we're experts on poop. We, we have poop messages. We have poop conferences. We have pictures of different poops. We know the style of dog, the, the kind of dog, the big dog, little dog, old dog, young dog. We even know the age of how long. Well, that, that's been there a while. But boy, that's fresh stuff. See what happens to us in sin. Sin makes us stink, but you're not sin. You're light. Is that not what he said? Is that not what he said? Do you believe that or not? You are light. But light walks in light will step into poop. I don't want to be an a, a expert about poop. But if we're not careful... We begin then to take all of this that he described, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, uh, that's all poop. And we begin to concentrate, and that's fine. Learn about it. You can read about it. Uh, you, and we can predict, boy, that came from a big dog, little dog. But when you stepped into poop, you have to know how to get rid of it. You don't get rid of darkness by cursing darkness. Darkness is not removed by cursing darkness. You step in poop, I can come along and say, you shouldn't be stepping in poop. Does that help that man? Does that remove the stink? What removes it? <laughs> well, the real kind of poop, what do you do? <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you do? You're going to go home and say, what kind of message was that? Well, he talked a lot about poop. You have to get something else to remove the poop. And if it's real bad, I take you to just throw it out, man. Get rid of that stuff. You get some water. Scrub it off. Did not Jesus teach us this? Did he not show us how to deal with people with dirty feet? He gave us all, read that in the gospel, read it in the gospel of John, read it over and over again. He comes to Peter, and Peter says, Lord, you don't need to wash my feet. And he says, yeah, if you don't, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. There's something that is not connected to me, and I need to get that off of your feet. Then Peter says, well, then, man, wash me from the top to the bottom. He says, no, 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 I don't, you are clean. You are clean because of my word. Oh, hallelujah. The word, as you hear the word, oh, you got heard the gospel, and the gospel caused you to be born again. The power of God went to work because of the word, and the word caused you to be born again. And now you're a child of love. You're a child of light, and now you're learning how to walk. But in the walk, you're going to step into some poop. So how do you get rid of the poop? You begin to take the water of the Word and let it wash you and let it cleanse you. Let it begin to 
take away all the uncleanness. Uh, you can't take poop and remove poop. Uh, you can be an expert of sin. You can preach on sin until you drop dead. But that does not remove the sin. What removes the sin is that wonderful water of the Word of God. Hallelujah. This will take away the poop. Amen. All right, let's take another leap. All right? You got that settled. You good? I feel like, have you ever watched that long jump in Olympics? You know, Olympics are going to happen in the, these long jumps. Man, live. I didn't look it up. I wanted to. I don't know what, some of you might know, what's the longest long jump ever? How long? 29 feet. But they don't just jump. They run, they take one step, another leap, and then they jump. Well, we got to go, we're going to take one leap, another leap, and then a long jump. All right? So the first leap is you and I now know how to deal with sin. You let light, light, the Word of God, you let the Word of God have entrance, and it begins to cleanse you and wash you. If I see somebody that stinks, I don't go to him and just say, man, you stink. You ought to clean up. No, I can wash his feet. That's what pastors, preachers, what preachers? Have you been listening? Have you allowed the Word of God to come and take rid of that poop? You'll smell better. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's take another leap, all right? I know, I know. Some of you are already pulling muscles on the first leap. <laughs> I can, I see, you really, folks, I love you. I love this place. You're so, you want to do it, man. It's like, can you see Ron and I doing a three-step leap, 24 feet? I'd be good to get a foot. I've pulled muscles. I've, I've, I've read in the light shines. It's so bright. Oh, God, it's bright. So I said, come on, Lord. Man, it's bright. He said, you want to know why it's bright? Yeah, tell me, because you love darkness. <laughs> this section over here, man. See, they're already on the other leap. So when the Lord says you love darkness, I, what do I do with that? Well, that's a fact, man. I love darkness. So, Lord, will you... Change my love. So he doesn't, he, he, what does he do to me? He loves me. He loves me more. Well, I'm in the dark. And he loves me more and loves me more. And then all of a sudden, I can begin to see a little bit of light. He doesn't immediately take you from darkness and just bam. Now, spiritually, you're already there. But we need to learn how to walk in it. Now, some of you are about like a nightlight. <laughs> <laughs> we're on the other leap now. <laughs> we're, we're going, but in this conference, God's changing bulbs. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Some of you have a little nightlight. Well, thank God. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Well, hey, man. And then when you're used to that nightlight, God will come along and say, I'm going to give you a 40-watt bulb. Woo! I'm no longer a nightlight. I'm a 40-watt bulb. Some of you are like lightning bugs even, just, <laughs> just flashing and going, flashing and going. That's okay. You're good. <laughs> you're, you're good. Amen. Amen. One Sunday, boom, light. Next Sunday, dark. Boom, dark. Boom, dark. Oh, that's Brother Lightning Bug. Don't be mad at him. Don't try to go over there and just say, well, straighten up, man. What's the matter with him? He's just a little lightning bug, man. He can't carry a big old 100-watt bulb. His little butt's just big enough, just a little flash. <laughs> Amen. But don't worry. God's changing. He's he renewing my mind. When I'm, my mind being renewed, man. There had been fantastic preaching. Just fantastic, man. As they begin to bring out that word, all of a sudden, my little night light. Woo, give me a bigger bowl. I can handle a little more light. Come on. So he says, okay, if you want more light, give it to me. Sock it to me. He doesn't come and throw poop on me. 
he begins to make me brighter. Lighten up. Whoa, man. And then when you have more light, what happens? Oh, these are tough questions. You, 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 you. I really want to get into that second leap because the third leap is great. Do you want to know the three leaps? Sin, light, glory. Okay, so, all right. See if I can get to glory because that... That'll blow your mind, man. That'll, that'll take your 100-watt bulb and just blow it out. It'll just... Poof. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you have more light, what, what happens? Pardon me? It's brighter. And then when it's brighter, what happens? Praise God. You see more. But some things I don't want to see. Ron and I would go to bars. Have you ever been to a bar bright like this? <laughs> Mark, come on. You've been there too, brother. That bar has little candles. And everything's dark. And then you wear sunglasses in the bar. And everything then is in your imagination. That woman with you're with is a knockout beauty. She is a beauty queen, and that woman, that man she's with, he's another, whoever, John Travolta, I don't know. He's that Fabio guy, long blowing hair, man. It's all in your imagination, because you got to keep it dark. But the problem that Ron and I have, we'd stay in the bar till the lights went on. And when the lights went on, my God, Mrs. Frankenstein you're with. You're, you're, all of a sudden, was, whoa. So that, that's why the Lord, he says, you, 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 you love darkness. I said, Lord, I know because it gets bright. There's things on me that I may not want to see. I don't know, you ladies, you, you're way ahead in this. You're light years ahead of us in this because you, you not only have a, a, a sink with bright lights, then you have a magnifying glass with lights around that. Us men, we don't need that. We dress in a nightlight. And we still think we're bad looking, got muscles everywhere. We, we, but you ladies, see, when you get a big old light, there's a pimple. There's a wrinkle. So you go to work on that. You are not a pimple. You are light. The Lord says, I'm going to remove spot and wrinkle. My bride is the most beautiful bride. She is fantastic. She is brilliant. She is glorious. And I have to do a little work. I'm going to remove any spot or wrinkle. But before I can do that, I need the bride's permission. He's not going to come knock you down and pop a pimple. <laughs> Amen. Does he want to? Oh, he's wanting to get at it. That big honking thing on your forehead. He wants to pop that baby. But it takes light. So step in the light. And if there's a pimple on you and the preacher preaches pimples uh, and you've got one, uh, say, Lord, I got one right here. He's the one that'll even pop it. He's the remover of sin. He takes it away. He takes away your sin. Where does he take it? I have no idea. He just goes way out there, and he never brings it back. My sin is so separated from me, and as far as the east is from the west, it can never be joined together because you are light. Now we're going to see you getting brighter in here. Uh oh All right. Let's take another leap. Second Corinthians, I appreciate it. Manny, that you did some fantastic, man, I just love this. He got to going, and I wanted to just stand up and said, preach it, brother, preach it all. But he didn't, man, because there were some other things that I got to bring out here. Second Corinthians chapter 4, I want to talk about how to handle light. You are light, but you have to handle it correctly. Um, what's uh, Star Wars. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Our problem is we are children, and we just, and four or five heads of people are slick, cut right off. We don't, we don't, we just, how do I handle this light? Because that's your ministry. Look at what he reads. Or look what he reads. Look what. (laughs) Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have received mercy. We do not lose heart. You have ministry. This ministry is not like the old ministry. Chapter 3 tells us all about the two kinds of ministry. There's the ministry of the Old Testament and the priesthood. There's the ministry of the New Testament and priesthood. He's saying, you do not have the old, you have the new ministry. Yes. You have the new ministry. Do you know what that is? Do you know how to operate? Do you know how to use the light? Light today is, is such a fantastic lasers. They can remove, be so specific, they can remove parts of human bodies. Teeth can be filled, whatever. There's such a fantastic uh, uh, invention today, creation of using light. But you have to know about it. You have to study. And so you go before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a child of light. Uh, Now teach me how to walk in light. Teach me how to use the ministry of light. Lord, teach me even in in my speaking, uh, how do I handle this? Uh, How do I deal with this, Lord? Because I have a ministry that is so powerful. It can deliver. It can heal. It can set free. But God, when I try to do some things, I want people heal. I want people delivered. I want people set free, but they're not getting free. It is because he says, boy, you can't set people free by the old ministry. Look at this. Since we have ministry, uh, this ministry, I encourage you to read chapter 3. Chapter 2, watch this once again. In verse 13, 14, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of the knowledge in every place. Odor. Smell good. Smell good. Where's Pastor Dennis? There he is. Smell good, brother. You smell good. Get around them. Smell them. (laughs) There's an odor, brother. You have an odor. Amen. Amen. I'm getting you. Amen. You're a son of wealth. You're a disciple of men, and you're going to disciple helps ministry. God's going to download in your life helps. And helps is not those that help just clean carpets, move chairs, and all that. Thank God for all that. But helps are those that can handle money and the power of wealth to begin to feed the administrator, to begin to meet needs. You are a man that disciples millionaires. You have an odor and a smell an anointing. We can call it anointing if you'd rather call that, but there's a specific anointing upon your life. That anointing causes a diffusion. It causes an aroma comes out, and people that will get around that aroma and learn to listen to you, they become millionaires. They will become men and women that can handle money and the power of money and direct money to bring every need met financially in the house of God. Hallelujah. Thus saith the Lord, we thank you, Father. Light. So he begins to say, therefore, since we have this ministry, if we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully. 
You and I are handlers of the Word. I pray, I said, oh God, that I would not handle this in any deceptive way. That I, because you can use this word, it's so powerful that you can preach this word out to people and you can take that group of people and deceive them, get money from them, get commitments and sacrifice from them. This word is powerful. It is a two-edged sword, sharp, sharp, sharp. And if you do not know how to use the word of God, you will cut yourself. You will cut others. Uh, Instead of using a knife for surgery, you will slit throats. Uh, You will cause people pain and anguish because you do not know how to use the word of God. You have a ministry. You have a responsibility. You got saved and said, Jesus, come into my life. The Word came into your life. The Word is not something written on a page. The Word is Jesus Christ. The Word is His name. It's His deity. It is the name of God. That third person in the Trinity, before He became Jesus, He was Word. If you want to say, Word, I love you, you are addressing God. You are addressing that Uh, part of the Trinity, Father, God, Father, Word, Spirit. Uh, But when the Word became flesh, He was then given a name, Jesus. I can approach Him, and when I say Jesus, uh, I'm approaching a humanity. I'm man to man. Let me know Him as a man. Let me know how it was to walk in love. Let me know how it was to handle the Word. Let me know. I want to walk like a man. The only man that there was was Jesus Christ. But before He became a man. He was Word. And so I can take the Bible and I can say, oh, Word, now you're handling something, folks, that is so powerful. He has submitted Himself. Can you imagine the humility of God that He would let you handle Him? Here I am. You want to know about love? He says that I am love. Love will allow the other one to handle any way you want. You can do with the Word anything you want. He will not stop it. He will not delay it because we're living in a particular time period that He is allowed. He is doing in this and this dispensation. He is allowing the Word to be handled. But that will not always be. There will come a time when no one will handle the Word again. No one will abuse it. No one will mock it. No one will do it. In a moment of time, he will come. And by the brilliance and the brightness of the light, he will bring every atheist, every mocker, every whoremonger, every person to his knee. And every mouth will be shut. I read this passage of Scripture. And it says, you have received mercy. And I said, Lord, explain to me what that means. So now I can take a little more light, see? He wants to download so much to you, but you can't because you're still that little nightlight. He'll work with a nightlight for the rest of your life. You can be buried as a nightlight. You'll get to heaven as a nightlight. I'm not too sure what will happen there. But there. But at the moment of time, it's like, you can't, you know what the Lord, he did, never mind. And so, so but right, I said, Lord, I want to bright. I want to be bright, bright, bright. Lord, I can handle it. I can handle it. I can handle it. He says, okay, son, you asked me a question. You asked me, what is this mercy? The mercy is I have allowed you to be able to come into my presence, number one, because Paul writes to Timothy and says that God is an unapproachable light and no man has been able to approach him. You think man can just walk up to God anytime he wants to? These proud egomaniacs uh, that just walk away, I just tell God what I want. Oh, really? Really? Why don't you just lick your finger and put it into a socket? See how that'll do. (laughs) See how that'll work. How much much electricity? Can you handle 220? Oh, brilliant one. Man in darkness. Amen. The mercy is that I can come into light. And the other thing is, he says, I allow you to say something. The mercy you have is that you're able to come to God and talk to Him. 
Who are we approaching, folks? Do not allow His love and liberty to deceive you, thinking that He is not God, that He's some human being that you can treat and mistreat and abuse and say whatever for the time being He can. That's His mercy. Come to me. I'll, I'll give you mercy. What is the mercy? Talk to me. Tell me your woes. Tell me your troubles. And we'll sit down together, and we will reason together, and we will work through those issues. Oh, what mercy we have tonight. What mercy that I can come to God, and I can even have the audacity to complain to Him. And He doesn't just strike me. He doesn't just wither me up. He just doesn't dismiss me. He can do anything He wants, but He humbles Himself because He loves us. And so I have received mercy And so, Lord, teach me how to handle the Word. Goes on. Okay, renounce some things. Shame. You have shame because the light shines. And you see the pimple. God, how did that get there? You stepped in the stuff, whatever. And it causes shame. He says renounce that stuff. What is renounce? It means don't own it. You don't own it anymore. I renounce that shame tonight. I'm a son of God, a daughter of God, and I approach my Father, and I'm the light, and I walk in the light. And yes, there may be some issues here, and God is removing that, and I let Him, and they have no shame. I renounce it. Amen. Renounce means I don't own it anymore. I sold a car once that belonged to my daughter. A guy bought it. It was his car. He calls a week later and says, I want my money back. He says, we ain't getting it. Right, this car's not good enough. Here we go. Well, I sold the car. I, I, I renounced the car. It don't belong to me. I'm not going to maintain it. It's your car. I'm sorry if you're having trouble with it. You had every right to test drive it, do whatever. But you liked it, you wanted it, you bought it. Your shame doesn't belong to you. Quit maintaining it. Quit walking around and feeding it and checking the tires and pumping it up. Oh, it's just so shame. Renounce the stuff, would you? That shame does not belong to me. I renounce it in the name of Jesus. I don't belong to that shame. That shame belongs to someone else. They come to people in the world know how that. They got dope in their pocket. And the cop comes, pulls out a big old bag of dope. Oh, that ain't mine. That's my brother. I, I'm wearing his pants. That, I don't know how that got there. They know how to renounce stuff. <laughs> Amen. Here we are. We gather shame up. We just, we, we just, you know, brew them in a dustpan of shame, and then we put it in our pocket. We get into a fellow said, man, look at this shame here, man. It is shame. Renounce it. He said, would you just renounce it? And then handle the Word of God. How to handle it. Oh, that, it takes a long time. How to handle it. So it begins to go on. Now, now watch this. We're still in that second leap, okay? We have this ministry. We've renounced hidden things of shame, not walking, craftiness, handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, committing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, even if our good news is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. I read that I said, Lord, how does the God of this age blind the eyes of men and women? How do they blind it? How do they, how do they get blinded? How does the God of this age do it? You want a little light, okay? This is probably 80 watt. If you go to chapter 3, it says in verse Well, let's read 13. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. Sound familiar? Their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. He gets preachers to preach the law. And all of a sudden, a veil begins to come over your eyes. You have to be careful with the Old Testament. 
Be very careful with it. Because if I take the Old Testament, I begin to read out of that Old Testament, and I do not read it properly. I do not read it from the position of a child of light. If I don't allow the light to shine through those scriptures, and I just begin to use Old Testament and say, well, this guy and that guy and this one, all of a sudden the crowd and the audience will begin to have a veil put over them. When you use the law on yourself, your little rules of conduct, when you begin to put those rules, your commandments on yourself, you begin to be blinded and begin to move back into darkness. You are not handling the Word of God properly. How does the God of the world do this? He doesn't use all the sins and lusts of the flesh and all that. He gets preachers or teachers begin to teach out of the old and begin to all of a sudden as he does that, then a darkness begins to come over that audience. You have to be careful with the Old Testament. Amen. I began to ask the Lord, how come we're asleep? What, what makes us fall asleep? Uh, Pastor Moon did a fantastic job. He, he touched on it. He, he got what it was. We, I, I want to use not what he did. He used David and Ziglag, and David learned how to encourage himself. Okay, in the New Testament, but not in the, well, it, it, it was in the Gospels. And Jesus is, is telling the disciples, where I'm going, you can't come. I'm going to leave. And he says, because I've said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. And then he goes on and he says, in a moment, you'll no longer see me and the world will rejoice. But then in another moment, the world won't see me, but you will and the joy will come back to your life. He's talking this language that these men who are not born again, the disciples that follow Jesus are simply disciples, men, natural men, not born again men. They are following Jesus Christ. They're walking with Jesus, and they're living in the light of Jesus himself. But there was coming a time, he says, well, I'm going to leave, and darkness will be, be back. I'm, I, the light's going to leave, and darkness is going to come in the earth. And you're going to be in the dark for a while. But don't worry about it. He didn't, you, you and I, because we're, we're, we're past that, we look back at it, we know exactly what he did when he died, and he was gone, he was buried in that time period, darkness covered the earth. But when he rose from the dead, light, boom, boom. So during that time period before he died, he was, he was in great travail, and he had the three key disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. He says, you stay here and pray. I'm going to go a little bit further and pray. And we know the story. He comes back. They're sleeping. He wakes them up, goes back and prays, comes back. They're sleeping. And the book of Luke says that they pray or they slept from sorrow. There's sorrow. There's great sorrow in the world. There's a wailing in the world. You and I as believers, we go through these trials. We go through temptations, vicious things. Ernest preached this morning about touched on it. All of us have pains. I, I sit in a congregation. I look at us. I love you guys. We love one another. But I know un underneath that there's sorrow. That sorrow He'll just go to sleep. I can't, I, I just need to take a nap. I just, I just need to go to sleep. You don't sleep willfully to ignore God or to, you don't want light. It's not that at all. You're, you're asleep because of sorrow. And the Lord is shaking. He's waking you up, see. He's, he's, he's dealing with you. And so, he says in this passage that, when you read the Old Testament, that veil begins to come over your eyes. What I mean by that, I'll, I'll use Pastor Moon's sermon because I just I was so excited about it when he's talking about David encouraging himself. Oh, David, what a unique man. But he's Old Testament. He was never born again. He's a unique man. And he's lost everything. You can listen to uh, Pastor Moon's sermon. And it said that he encouraged himself in the Lord. He called for the priest and the ephod. And when he said that, New Testament people see that in the old. It's a shadow. The priest and the ephod. Well, you and I have a priest, don't we? We have a high priest. 
Oh man, high priest. I can go to the high priest named Jesus. I don't need some cloth. I don't need some ephod. I don't need some garment. I have a high priest. You have a high priest. And I go to him and he begins to come to me with that brilliant light. And all of a sudden I'm encouraged in the Lord. He begins to speak to me. He begins to talk to me. So you're able to take the old, but never use the old just by itself. Uh, because if you do, it begins to bring a veil over your eyes. Uh, but you have been born again. David was a man that loved God. He loved the presence of God. And you remember when he got the ark, and he began to bring the ark back into Jerusalem. He was so excited. That ark uh, was the presence of God. And the oxen stumbled. And you remember what was uh, He reaches out and touches that piece of furniture, and bang! Him, he's dead. And David gets mad. He gets angry. He said, Take that away. All I want is his presence. All I want is to feel him and to know him. Oh, that he would restore my spirit. Give me a new spirit, oh God. You don't need to pray that anymore. We don't live in the old, we live in the new. He gave you a spirit. You've been born again. And it was there, if you read Psalm 110, he begins to talk about God and the rulership of the king. And he says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I'm reading a book or a letter written by a man in the old Melchizedek. He was under the Levitical priesthood. That's why he couldn't bring in the presence. One man once a year could go into the presence of God. And he had to come with blood of bulls and goats. And offer that up for the sins. One man, folks, out of millions. One man. And David longed to be that. And God gave him a revelation. God gave him light. And he says, oh, David, uh, I know your heart, boy. I know you want my presence. Uh, but there has to be a drastic change in humanity. They can't do it right now the way you want. It's after the order of Melchizedek. And David, uh, all of a sudden, he grabbed something by faith. Uh, he reached into thousands of years before him by faith. Uh, and he grabbed a priesthood that was called Melchizedek. And he said, I got it, boys. I have a priesthood. It is no longer the Levitical. That's going to pass away. We have the order of Melchizedek. And David went back and got that presence of God, and he brought it into Jerusalem. And all David did, he didn't need three departments. He just set up a tent, put the ark in there, and he began to get the crowd, the choir to sing. And he said, sing, boys and girls, sing. And they began to worship 24 hours a day and the presence of God came because there was a man named David that could reach forward into the order of Melchizedek and enter into that presence of God. And you and I sit here today under that very presence. Uh, we can have the presence of God. Uh, we can enter in. We can sing and we can worship. Uh, and we have His presence. Uh, and you sit here bored. You sit here dull. You sit here blinded because you can go into the presence of God. How can we be blind? Oh, how can we? The light. And all of a sudden I see, oh, Lord, what kind of ministry do I have? He said, son, you are a priest. Do you know what a priest does? He can go into the presence of God. And I can worship. I can love him. Oh, God. And he washes me with his word. And he tells me how much I'm loved. See, watch this, folks. It's right here. It's in here. He says, the word, the God of this age blinded, who do not believe, lest the light. Man, he said, lest the light. There it is again. Lest the light of the gospel, good news, of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves. I go into that holy of holies. I go into that tabernacle of praise. I go into that light. And I begin to fellowship with that light. And then that priest, he comes out of that light. And he does not preach ourselves. 
He does not preach about himself. He does not preach about politics. He does not preach about this thing and that thing. He doesn't gossip. He doesn't preach his uh, uh, pet peeves. Uh, he doesn't preach at people. He becomes a great sower of the Word of God. He begins to just throw the seed out. He begins to throw it out, and he begins to not preach himself, but he preaches what he's received in the holy place. He preaches what he has been touched. Uh, he preaches that which he has seen. Now watch this. Stick with me in verse 6, for it is God, here we go, Manny, thank you, brother, who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown where? Where does God shine the light? Come on, are you reading it? No, 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 no. For it is God who commands light. God commands. Hey, I can't do this. I'm not a commander of light. He is. And I know he does that now. He's doing it right now. He says, boy, you preach my word. And my word, if they'll receive my word, the entrance of my word gives light. And I've commanded that light to go specifically where? Heart. Heart. You have something beautiful. The Old Testament says what about the heart? It's deceitful and wicked. Who can know it? But oh, thank you, Jesus. He did a heart transplant. Amen. I've been born again. I don't have a heart of stone. I have a heart of flesh. I have a brand new heart. Hallelujah. 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 I have a new heart, brother. And written on my heart is the law. I don't need the law written on stone. I don't need the Ten Commandments. I have a law written in my heart. Hallelujah. In the light of God will shine right into my heart. He doesn't hit your head. That light doesn't shine into your head. We're trying to get that light to shine. I don't understand it. God, you're just burning holes in your brain. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard that which he has prepared for those that love him, but he has given his spirit. And by the Spirit, you shall know the mind of Christ, the mind of God Himself by His Spirit. And His Spirit is that light that hits your heart. So I declare and warn you tonight to protect your heart. Offense, bitterness, bitterness, offense, my heart has been broken. And Jesus said, there's an anointing upon me. The Spirit of God rests upon me, and I will heal the brokenhearted. Yes, you came to God, and your heart was shattered. It was in little pieces, abused by man, trampled down, kicked around, betrayed, stabbed, ugly, it wasn't that God was mad. He loves. And he says, this heart, I've got to do something with this heart. And the only thing, and there's the Father and the Son, the Father and the Word and the Spirit at a great council table. What are we going to do? And the Word. <laughs> he said, I'll go. He stood up and said, Father. I'll go. Send me. The Father and the Spirit stood up and says, we got it. We'll not only destroy the works of the devil, we will make man who the devil has shattered into something brand new. And he will have access to me that no angel does. No angel does he ever say, son, no angel does he ever visit. No angel does he ever just sit down and just drink a cup of coffee with. But God commands angels. God tells angels, go, and they go. Some angels have never even been in the presence of God. Yes. Did you hear that? Some angels have never stood in the presence of God. Why should they? 
God is king. God is almighty. We have President Biden. I've never been in his presence, but I know I have a president. Like or dislike, doesn't matter. He's president. I've never been in his presence, but I'm underneath his authority in a one way. Here is God. He's not a man. He's God. He commanded and created angels. There are some angels never been in his presence. And when Gabriel came to Mary and said, Mary, I am Gabriel, and he identified himself by one mark, he said, I stand in the presence of God. That tells me something about Gabriel. Gabriel is an angel that has the privilege of standing in the presence of God. You and I, sons and daughters, can come and say, excuse me, Gabriel, Michael, It's probably not like this. It's like, excuse me. And they immediately watch. They immediately step aside and they watch. There's Ron. That's his son. One angel at one time, we get a little glimpse, came to God. And I can see this angel with his wings over his head. Oh, God. If I could ask you one question, what is man that you are so mindful? What is man that you would visit him? Do you think God visits an angel? Do you think God comes and checks up on angels? Are you okay, buddy? He commands them. He did not come to give aid to angels. He came, and when the Word stood up and said, send me, the Word did not become an angel. It became a man. When he died, and death got a hold of him and drug him into that death. He came out of that grave. And he came out born again. At first, he was the only begotten of the Father, but when you read the Scripture after that resurrection, he was the firstborn from the dead. You might be the hundredth born from the dead, 20,000th born from the dead. Who cares? But when you came out of the grave and been born again, you came as an heir of God and co-heir of Jesus Christ. Let's make the third leap. and uh, I won't have time to do this, but Let me just, in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, arise, shine. (laughs) For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light. How are they going to come? Light. Light will attract them. Light, they'll come to the light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Um, when my son, my second son, when he was four years old, he fell off a meat locker. Uh, Mark will remember in Pueblo, we were remodeling this building. This meat locker was about nine feet up in the air. And he climbed on this ladder and got on there playing around. And we don't know how it happened, but he, he fell off that meat locker. And when he fell, he hit his head on a concrete floor. And the doctor told us it was like taking a watermelon, just dropping on sidewalk, just shattered, just shattered all, all of this. And uh, Becky, I was out of town, and I got the news, came back home, long story short, that when the doctor, he says, I, I don't know if he'll even live. We've got to get in, do surgery, remove bone, his head swelling up. And so 
Uh, they didn't know he was going to live. And then they said if he does live, he, he may not even move. He might be paralyzed. We don't know. He may not talk or see or anything. So we got that news, and they went and performed the surgery, and then they took him in intensive care, and they put him under an oxygen tent, and his, his head's all wrapped up in a bandage. It's, it, it swelled up so bad that his little ear was touching his shoulder, tubes running in and out. He was just out of it. He was in a coma. And uh, I got there, and, and, and the doctor said, you know, it's, it's great in, in one way. He's moving. His arms are moving. His legs are moving back and forth. But he's in a coma, and we don't know how long that'll last. And if he does come out of it, we don't, we don't really know uh, what the outcome is. We'll just have to wait and see. But when he begins to move around, if you'll talk to him, if you try to wake him up. And so this glory, I, 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 you can't define it. You have to, you have to, you have to experience it. And... Uh, Using this story to try to define glory of God. I use this story, and uh, I remember the day he'd been in a coma about a week. And I'd be uh, sitting next to him. He saw tubes running in and out and all that stuff. And he'd get to moving. And I'd say, Kevin, 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 Kevin. He'd just move. We'd do that every time. And this one specific time, He's moving like this. I said, Kevin. And he opened his eyes. I go, Kevin. And he just stared right at me. I said, do you know who I am? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> who am I? You're my dad. You, you don't know what that did to me. That happened over 40 years ago. And I can still see it. I, I was on the second floor of the hospital. I, I had to get out. I had to get out of the, the room. And I ran out of the room. And I ran downstairs, got in my car. And I'm just weeping in my car. I said, oh, God. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll be anything you want me to be. Do you realize... God is calling your name. Joe, when you get shaking, he said you're receiving a kingdom that will be in the shaking. Joe, Joe, and all of a sudden you open your eyes. And he says the question, do you know who I am? Yeah. You're my father. Do you realize what happens to God? Do you realize the excitement of heaven that my children are waking up and they know who I am? In that glory, that is a taste somehow, the glory of God. Ernest, when you preach the joy of the Lord, I wanted to jump up because God shined a light on it in a way. He said, son... It's not your joy. It's my joy. You are the joy of the Lord. You make me happy. You cause a joy in heaven. Jesus said about it. He says when a sinner repents, we think of this Old Testament theology. When a sinner repents means he wakes up from the dead. He's been in a coma and all of a sudden he wakes up and he says, God, you are my Father in the glory, in the glory, in the glory, in the glory begins to cover you. Oh, beloved, let me tell you, we are sitting in gross darkness. It is gross darkness. It is not just darkness. It is gross darkness. Do not let that darkness get a hold of you. Do not let it crowd in. You can't curse darkness. Give up all. Well, we are cursed. Everybody else to go to hell. You can't curse darkness and change it. But take the light and shine that light. And light never argues with darkness. Light never battles with darkness. Light shatters darkness. Light 
penetrates darkness and darkness flees because of the light. And right now, in this moment of time, you are children of light and the Gentiles, those that do not know God, those that are in darkness, those that are blind are beginning to come and they will come to you for one purpose. They don't come for a free meal. They don't care about children programs. They don't care about music. They don't care about any of that stuff. They don't care about anything. They need the light and you just let that light shine and they shall be delivered. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet and worship him. Oh Lord, we worship you. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you and we praise you. We praise you. Pastor Reuben, you, you heard him call, come away with me. Son, come away. And you answered that call. And he wants you to know the reason of going away with him. It's not just for your emotions. It is not just so you can know something. And going away with him, your hearing has improved. The purpose of going away with God, folks, the purpose of getting away with him is that my hearing improves. My listening improves. Uh, to have more light, you have to listen better. There will be a time, I'm telling you this, there's going to come a time in the body of Christ as we begin to worship and we begin to praise God, there will be no noise. There'll be no instruments playing. There'll be no hooting and hollowing. But I love it. I'll, I'll shout with the best of them. But there's coming a time that we enter into the Father's house in the way, and the Father wants to sit down with you and talk. And He can't talk to you because you're talking. But He's such a Father that He is a listener. One thing I've learned about the Lord is that He listens. He's the best listener. He listens and listens and listens. He never, sometimes you want him to say something, sometimes you want an answer back, but all he's doing is listening. Because your healing is even that which is coming out of darkness into the light. And when you talk to someone about your problems and your issues, you're getting that in the dark out into the light. And once it's manifested there, it can be dealt with. As a matter of fact, your deliverance comes more just by being in the light, getting something out into the light. Just that in itself will take care of it and get free. But there's no greater listener. Pastors and ministers and preachers, you're going to begin to preach at a level that will amaze you yourself. Because you're going to be one with a tongue that is able to direct that light. And you'll not be a preacher of the Old Testament. You'll not be a preacher of legalism. You'll not be a preacher of just of boxes and rules and touch not and handle not. You'll preach Christ. You'll preach Christ. You'll preach the Word. Amen. Pastor Ryan, you're a son of the Word, and you love the Word because you love Jesus. You love Jesus because you love the Word, and you begin to teach that Word, and that Word is going to go out, and God Himself, God Himself, God Himself will command the light, and He will confirm that Word with signs. He'll confirm that Word with deliverances and healings. Uh, I can see you teaching, just unemotional, not sh just sharing the Word of God as you did today, and that Word is going to go out, and people sitting in there, all of a sudden, insanity is going to flee out of their minds. Uh, all of a sudden, their pains will begin to feel a little bit better. All of a sudden, a husband will look over at his wife and see her for the first time, begin to love her instead of hating and have bitterness uh, simply because you are a man of the Word and you love the Word. You don't study the Word. You don't memorize the Word. You fellowship with the Word. You're fellowshipping with light. How can a man fellowship with light? God invites us in 1 John. He tells us, folks, uh, to come and fellowship, and our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. We have a table set before us, and that table is in the presence of your enemies. Do you realize you have a seat at the table? And who sits at that table? You have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Ghost, and you have sitting at the table, and you have a voice at that table. You can say, excuse me, Father, what about this? And the Father will listen. He'll take even what you say, and He'll begin to work it. He'll begin to work things through. In the presence of your enemies, uh, the devil's right back there. He doesn't even have a seat at the table. He wants it. He longs for it. 
And the only reason he gets at the table is because you open up a chair and allow him to sit down. He wanted to get into the heavens. You and I are seated in heavenly places. How does the devil get there? You brought him. Well, how, how did I bring him? Because you believe his lies. The moment you believe a lie. Oh, no one loves me. Lie. Do you realize what that lie does? Oh, you might manipulate some folks. You might get some money from people. That's witchcraft. That lie, you partner with the devil, and he just walks on in with you. Renounce that lie. That's a lie. No one loves me. Lie. So what do you do? You take that lie. God, I lie. I, I'm believing in a lie. The lie I believe in is you don't love me. No one loves me. That's a lie. And I renounce it, and I, I, I have no ownership. I just cast it away. That's a lie. And then you say, Lord, what is the truth? And then let him speak to you. And then all of a sudden, he'll begin to shine light into your life, and you take that, and you hold on to that, and all of a sudden, you're fellowshipping with that word. Victor, son of worship. Oh, brother, you begin to worship. The Father seeks such to worship him in spirit and truth. Son of worship. Nicole Dennis, millionaire wealth. People get around you, brother, and you lead them in worship. When you begin to worship, all of a sudden angels, they're even saying Father, or they don't even call God Father. I'm said they, they can't call he they, they don't call God Father. They say, Holy, holy, holy. And what do you and I say? Abba, Father. Oh, what does that sound in the ears of angels? What does it sound in the ears of demons and powers of darkness and beasts that we know nothing about? These rooms and places. We begin to cry out, Oh, Abba, Father. And all of a sudden, God is your Father and He addresses you. And oh, Victor, you begin to worship God. People begin to learn to worship. God is going to take you places in worship and will begin to teach us how to worship. He will teach us how to worship. We worship. We call it worship services. It, it, we can call it that, folks. I, I don't want to shine too much light, but oh, that worship. I said, Lord, teach me worship. I don't know anything about worship. Would you teach me about it? I think worship, all of a sudden, we catch a glimpse of who and how brilliant he is and how much he loves us, and all of a sudden, my mouth stops, and I just fall on my face. I see old Apostle John, and he's on that Isle of Patmos, and he hears a voice behind him, and he turns to see that voice, and he sees the seven golden candlesticks, which are the churches. Do you want to know about the church? The Lord told me years ago, I'll show you the bride. I said, Lord, what? Do you know about a bride? No one sees a bride. Not in the real weddings, not in weddings and ceremonies. A bride is tucked away somewhere. The only one with a bride is maybe her mom and the maid of honors. All the women there that are the, uh, honoring the bride and they're dressing her up. No one goes in and sees. You and I, folks, ask them that. Ask them, ask them. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Show me the bride. And you say, okay, son, come here. And he'll take you into a room, and he'll just open that door a little bit, and you'll see it. You won't even know how to describe it. We pick on the church. I, I, I pick on it. I say this is wrong with them. That's all bad, and it's ugly, and all this, and sure, we can do that. That's okay. But within that ugliness, there is a bride. And you read those seven churches in the book of Revelation, and Jesus is in the middle of them. And you read about those churches that he loves. He so identifies himself. He says, I'm the head and you're the body. Amen.